Um, thank you all very much. And I, uh, it's a shame that we cannot um, indeed meet in person. But I've been asked today to talk about clinical phenotypes of COPD exacerbations and their treatment. These are my disclosures. I do not accept any honorary from industry. And I have some um, industry sponsored grants, mainly for early COPD. One of the reasons that we're interested in exacerbations, apart from all the morbidity, they affect disease progression. And this is a slide um, from our work showing that frequent exacerbators in blue have a faster disease progression than the infrequent um, exacerbators. And when we did the analysis, we computed that 25% of lung function decline was attributed to the effect of exacerbations. Recently, others have looked at how exacerbations affect lung function decline. And this is some data from COPDG. If you look on the right-hand side, you will see a solid line. And these are patients who between two visits did not have an exacerbation. The dotted line is where patients had an exacerbation. As you can see, if you have an exacerbation, you have a faster fall in FEV1. But particularly um, what is important, it's the gold one and the gold two patients where there is the greatest fall off in lung function decline. And this has important implications for, for phenotypes of COPD is that it's in the mild moderate patients that we really need to keep an eye on their lung function. So if they get an exacerbation, we do need to make sure it's properly treated and we need to, um, we need to um, make sure they are on a pre preventative treatment. I apologize that this is a little bit blurred, but this is data on hospitalizations from the Eclipse cohort. And you will remember that in Eclipse, we showed there were frequent exacerbators across the disease spectrum. This is the hospitalization data. The solid line at the top are the patients who did not have a hospitalization in the first year of Eclipse, and then Eclipse had a 24-month follow-up. So it was um, observed for a year and then 24 months follow-up. However, the patients who did have a hospitalization in the first year were more likely to have a hospitalization over the next two years. So one hospitalization is a risk for another one. And this is part of the frequent exacerbator phenotype. And then percent survival, um, you can see here that these patients who have a hospitalization have worse survival. And I think it's important to say at the beginning that exacerbations and survival go very closely um, together. We will talk a little bit about the mortality data from the triple studies. And I still think it is due to the effect of exacerbations. This was one of the very first papers we wrote, which is now 25 years ago. And we showed that factors predicting frequent exacerbations, apart from the number of exacerbations in the previous year, was bronchitis. So daily cough and sputum is very important. And daily cough and sputum, particularly in mild, moderate patients, is important. This is data, again, some older data from Copenhagen to show you that patients with chronic mucus hypersecretion, both men and women, had excess lung function decline. And they also were more likely to be hospitalized. And there's uh, data from all sorts of places that airway mucins are elevated in these patients, particularly in patients with frequent exacerbations. So bronchitis is one of the important phenotypes we need to look out for. The next issue is comorbidity. And comorbidity interacts with exacerbations. And here you can see exacerbations one, two, three, four. And you can see there's a higher risk of myocardial infarction in patients with frequent exacerbations. This is data that we obtained from a thin database. This is a large UK database. And again, recently, um, this is data from the summit study. This was a study looking at patients um, with cardiovascular risk and labo ICS. And this is their data on exacerbations in cardiovascular disease. And you can see that for all exacerbations, your chance 
of um, cardiovascular disease is highest again in the first 30 days. That's how they collected the data. But particularly, exacerbations requiring hospitalizations in the first 30 days after the onset of an exacerbation are more likely to be associated with a myocardial infarction or other cardiovascular event. So what about using beta blockers? So this was interesting in that there was a view that beta blockers can prevent exacerbations. I've always been a bit doubtful about this because I'm not sure the mechanism is there. Beta blockers, as you know, reduce the arrhythmias, they can improve cardiac function, they're protective against angina. And this is how they may well, they work on, I think, on the cardiovascular effects of the exacerbation rather than on the exacerbation. So this was the US trial. And here you can see placebo metoprolol. There was no effect on the actual exacerbation of COPD. This is very important. But this study was stopped early because they noticed that the patients who were on beta blockers did worse. And this is actually very interesting, not exactly sure uh, why this happened. And I think the message from this paper is that if patients need beta blockers for cardiac things, this is very important. And again, there's evidence if you treat with beta blockers, you have COPD and you have a myocardial infarct, you do better than the patients who are not on beta blockers. So I think but beta blockers will not affect exacerbations. So how um, are exacerbations caused? And I don't think anyone now will doubt that viruses are, are the prime causes of exacerbations. We've actually noticed a reduction in exacerbation because in the UK, everyone is so scared of COVID that the COPD patients had been shielding and we're only beginning to see the exacerbations now as restrictions are um, reduced in the UK. Bacteria, I think, are secondary invaders. I think few um, exacerbations are actually caused by bacteria, but that's arguable. And then pollutants are important because they increase viral action. You'll notice that there's a whole literature on COVID and pollution, which I think is difficult. We published some of this and is published in the Blue Journal. Um, then you have an inflamed airway, more airway inflammation, and you get dynamic hyperinflation, small airways disease, breathlessness, and exacerbation symptoms. There's also systemic inflammation, and that is how we believe it leads to cardiovascular comorbidity. This is just to show you what happens during an exacerbation. This is from our work. So EXP is exacerbation prevention. And you can see the virus in yellow. The, this is viral load done by PCR. So this is rhinoviral load. And you can see um, that there's a high rhinal bow at the beginning. It does fall quickly. And I think the same probably applies to milder cases of COVID where the viral load will fall quite quickly. Because people do um, say they have very short, some have very short illnesses. And in, with the common cold, if you want to pick up the virus, you've got to really do it within the first three to four days. And then the bacteria come in second. And you can see, basically, there were no bacteria detected at the beginning, and they increased to day 14. Now, everyone in this study was given steroids and antibiotics. And then um, here, the bacteria were found at the start. They go down and they go up again. And we know that there is quite a chance of recurrence of exacerbations, and it may some of it may be due to secondary bacterial infection, could be due to the steroids. The importance is if you're treating patients with more severe disease with steroids, I would cover them with antibiotics despite personal treatment. Now, you can use CRP to guide antibiotic treatment. I must say, I would still do it clinically because COPD is such an incredibly heterogeneous disorder. This is again older data from, um, from Leicester in the UK where they looked at various types of exacerbations. I can say straight off that they only found a third of viruses. They should have found more than that. We find at least 60 to 70 percent. They did find a lot of eosinophils at exacerbation. It may be they had patients with asthma COPD overlap. The predominant um, 
inflammation at a COPD exacerbation is actually neutrophilic because sputum is basically full of neutrophils. So I think this is very variable, but most patients, 90% of patients who have an exacerbation will produce sputum um, at exacerbation, and it is more likely to be neutrophilic. What do the bloody xenophils do? Well, they can go up or down. They are very variable at exacerbations. So how do we treat all of this? Well, we're particularly interested in the frequent exacerbators and the patients who are breathless with COPD. So group B are patients with a um, MRC index of two or more, CAT of um, 10 or more. These are the patients who are breathless. I must say, I think group B should be a LABA plus a LAM. And the reason that GOLD in the last update, which was three or four years ago now, put in the algorithm a LABA or a LAMA was because of the global reach and LABA LAMs were not available everywhere. But I think the management of COPD becomes much simpler. It's either a dual bronchodilator because you want to give patients the maximum relief of dyspnea. Dyspnea is closely related to exacerbations. So if you can um, relieve dyspnea, you will relieve exacerbations. Group B are my medium risk patients. They're breathless. They don't have a lot of exacerbations. I'll talk to you about it. Group A is the low risk patients. Group D are the patients with two or more exacerbations or hospital admission. And as I showed you before, once you have a hospital admission, you are very prone to have problems in the future. So a hospital admission is one of the most important markers that the patient has decompensated. And of course, it's group D where we'll give triples. I think the future of COPD treatment is dual bronchodilators to start off with and going on to a triple. Why are dual bronchodilators important? And I can show you this. This is some, um, this is actually treatment naive. This is why I like showing it. And a blue is teotropium, the dark is the combination, nice changes in FEV1. And you see this with all the dual bronchodilators. And um, here you can see it by gold stage. And regardless of gold stage, dual bronchodilators work because they reduce hyperinflation across the board. And they are the first line treatment. And the dual bronchodilator, the effect is translated into a reduction in dyspnea and a reduction in quality of life. Well, do bronchodilators work on exacerbations? The answer is yes. This was in Decatrol glycopronium against glycopronium, the first study that was done. And indeed, we do expect it to work because we know LAMAs reduce exacerbations. There's been a lot of data on teotropium reducing exacerbations and LABAs also reduce hyperinflation. So, it's hardly surprising that a dual bronchodilator works better than its component on exacerbation. In that study, we also had open-label teotropium, but we were not powered for it, which is really important. And this was not a three-arm study. We just added it at the request of the regulators. We just missed significance. And then Dynagito was performed which is a, was a much bigger study, 7,500. As, as you can see, there was also reduction in exacerbation. The only problem is that the p-value did not reach p equals 0.01, which was a pre-specified endpoint. And the reason it didn't is that adjustments were not made for covariance. And any of you who've been involved in exacerbation studies know they're pretty irregular events and you must adjust for covariance. If you do adjust for covariance, you get completely different results. And here is the adjustments made according to the Spark Flame Protocol, according to Hermes, which were the reflumolar studies, Trinity Trilogy, which were Chiesi Triple. And each time, if you reanalyze Dynagito according to this methodology, you get, as you can see, extremely positive p-value well below p equals 0.01. So I really think it's a no-brainer. They, they do um, labor lamas will always reduce exacerbation. 
why do how why do they work very interestingly so i think the top ones are obvious uh, reduction hyperinflation reduction of airway resistance imp- reduction in dyspnea i've talked a lot about um, dyspnea but also some people claim direct effects on inflammation we actually did a study where we tried to show this and couldn't um the uh, lamas may reduce viral activity in the lung there is some evidence for it again we did manage to show it but we do know that lamas particularly reduce sputum production and can improve mucosidia clearance so there are a number of mechanisms why bronchodilators can prevent exacerbations so we then move on with exacerbations and this is the goal this is dyspnea and just to point out that the lines move away from labor ICS. I think there is very little role for labor ICS in COPD unless you've got asthma COPD overlap. The starting point is a lab, a lab to reduce hyperinflation as much as you can to improve exercise capacity. If we look on the right-hand side, and again, if we start with the lab lab, we have a line arrow away from labor ICS. And here these eosinophils start coming into play. Now what gold says, if eosinophils are above 100, consider. They don't say use it, consider. If they say eosinophils are below 100, they suggest you do not use triple. Now I think there's a warning here in that this has not really been tested prospectively. And I think this is very important um, before because the options are not great. One of the options is reflumenos causes uh, side effects. Again, the label is less than 50% and exacerbations. And again, I'll show you some data. It's not great. Or one really starts treatment with a macrolide, which we know work better than bronchitic. Again, patients who have an additional bronchiectasis in addition to. Um, to that. So I think I would be careful about this. I will show you some data later on, which in fact does consolidate it, but it is all secondary analyses. So labalama, if you have more exacerbations, then move on to triple, but you do not treat isolated eosinophilia. Why is a labalama better than a labo ICS? It was flame, of course. I think this was an important study but again it's to be expected because the degree of dyspnea reduction with two bronchodilators is much more than with salmetrol which was an old labba and the fluticasone. Fluticasone do little to FEV1 or to dyspnea. Inhaled steroids reduce exacerbation so I think this is to be expected and also these were medium risk patients. Most of the patients 80 percent had one exacerbation in the previous year. And you can see, in fact, there were improvements right across in quality of life and rescue medication. This was a pretty positive study. And I think one reason that we would use a LABA LAMA in preference to a LABA ICS. We also, in that study, looked at bloody xenophils, and there was really no bloody xenophil cutoff at which the LABA ICS was better than the LABA LABA. But again, the warning is that we did withdraw people who were really above 5%. We had very little people with high eosinophils because we regarded that as asthma COPD overlap and patients who needed ICS. We actually withdrew inhaled corticosteroids in the FLAME study before we randomized them. So we couldn't have patients with asthma COPD overlap. So the LABA-LABA effect in COPD is, is um, independent of the blood is in a full level. So in patients with COPD who complain of dyspnea and exercise tolerance, despite the use of LABA-LABA, what do you do? And basically um, you use triple, but where there are exacerbations. Again, this is very important. We don't go to triple just to treat dyspnea. There are other ways to treat dyspnea. Look at the inhaler technique. Needs pulmonary rehabilitation. So there were two big studies, I think, of triple. This is impact. And just to remind you, this was triticasone and mechlidinium volantrol against the labalama labo ICS for a year. This is the important box. And the important box is to show you 
that half of these patients had two or more exacerbations in the previous year, and 25% were in hospital in the previous year. These were proper severe patients. They were different from the patients in flame. And of course, there was no easy nipple cutoff. And as expected, you do expect the triple to be better than the labalama and the labor ICS. This is to be expected. And on the right-hand side, you've got the time to the first event analysis. There's been a lot of discussion here about whether some of these patients have past asthma. I think, you, I think regardless of that, this is data that one expects. I want to show you this, because this is what I said. This is, if we, on the left-hand side, you can see the distribution of eosinophils. 60% were more than 200, 40% were above 200, gives you a feel for the population. But on the right-hand side, you, is blood eosinophils is on the x-axis. And the first thing is, is in fact, the all the annual exacerbation rate. And you can see on the Laba Lama, if you've got low eosinophils, you do well on the Laba Lama, but as the eosinophils go higher, exacerbation rate goes up while the ICS containing regimes of triple and the Laba ICS are very similar. If you then look at the rate ratios, you do get a feel here that, um, sorry, I just went there, that the patients who have the Laba Lama here at the top, in fact, do better at lower eosinophil counts. And this is where the recommendations have come that you use ICS above 100. In fact, probably the cutoff here is more like 150 to 200. But as I said, this has not been prospectively um, tested. So if we now move on to the mortality data, and these were very big studies, bigger than TORCH was or Uplift, and Basically, you, there are uh, mortality signals, and there was a reduction in mortality on the triple. This is a, a data from a second paper that was published in the Blue Journal, and it divides up the mortality data on whether the patients were on triple before or no triple. And you can see in blue is the triple and does the best on mortality. And if you had no triple beforehand, you still do pretty well. But if you divide up on ICS, about 80% of patients on inhaled corticosteroids at the beginning, there's an effect. So the patients who are on ICS at the start do get a benefit on mortality with triple. But if you were not on inhaled corticosteroids before the study, you had no benefit. Now, this may be also numbers. This is always very difficult when the numbers get smaller. But these three lines look very similar. So there is no doubt there are ICS-sensitive patients and there are ICS-insensitive patients, as I said, particularly those with low eosinophil counts. The other study was ethos and very similar patients, but two different um, doses of inhaled steroids were tried, 320 and I-60. One very interesting, because as you know, one of the problems with inhaled corticosteroids is pneumonia. So if you can lower the dose, the chance of pneumonia will be less. Pneumonia is a dose dependent and also more common in older people and in more severe COPD and also a year study. I haven't put a box around it, but the patients are very similar, 56% of patients had two or more exacerbations in the previous year. 21, 22% of patients had been in the hospital. So very similar, severe group. And this is the data on exacerbation, which I think is fascinating in that whether you are on 160 or 320, it's no different. You get your reduction in exacerbation. Remember, ICS adding to a lab a lab will always reduce exacerbations, that's what they do. But the dose doesn't seem to be important. And we knew that from the low dose adverse serotide and the studies that were done. If we now look at this data in relation to eosinophils, we see very similar data that I showed you with impact. If you 
are less than 150, the effect is not so good. And if you think bloody xenophils, low bloody xenophils occur in patients with a lot of neutrophilic inflammation in the airway, those are the patients more likely to have bacterial colonization. But more than um, 150 eosinophils here, um, whether you are on the 320 or the 160 dose, the effect is very similar. I think this is extremely nice. And this particular analysis is actually is in um, the supplement. What about mortality? And here it gets even more interesting in that it was a higher dose that showed the effect on mortality. Why is this? Well, it's the more severe patients who die, and it is possible that more severe patients need more ICS. I think we saw that when oral steroids were used 20, 30 years ago in studies, more severe patients were treated and steroids prevented exacerbations, oral steroids at the time. That led really to the inhaled studies such as Uroscope um, and Isolde and some um, US studies. So this is very interesting in that you do need a higher dose to reduce uh, mortality. I do think mortality and hospitalization and exacerbations are closely linked. It is very difficult to prove that in these types of studies because you need very large numbers to break down the mortality further. Um, I'm just briefly going back to impact because I really want to make the issue about smoking. I'm afraid smoking exacerbators do have a problem, and that is that the ICS is not as effective. So this is an impact triple versus the Laba Laba. The blue are the smokers, and you can see that the rate ratios are higher. Um, and in fact, it's only at about eosinophil counts of 150 to 200 that they start crossing the one barrier. And at the bottom are the um, severe patients, and these are the hospital admissions. So smoking is an issue. And we saw this in Eurospot, that the smokers, if you took out the active smokers, there was an effect of ICS on lung function decline. So patients must try and stop smoking at all severity, because ICS will not be as effective. And I've shown you that ICS has a mortality benefit. So factors to consider um, with these azinophils, I think I'm not going to argue about these azinophils. I think it is a biomarker. I still think that we have to use our clinical um, phenotypes. Also strong support exacerbations, two or more exacerbations, blood azinophils more than 300 against use, repeated pneumonia, affects people who have quite marked bronchiectasis exercise are prone to infections, a history of TB in the middle between 100 and, and 300 blood um, eosinophils and one exacerbation. So this is our medium risk patients. You have to make a call on this. And I think this is a clinical decision. What about um, anti-IL-5? Um, um, well, it's, if isinophils are important as anti-IL-5 works, two studies have been done. And this is the MEPO study, also Benralizumab, and both are being repeated in patients with high isinophils. As you got to higher isinophils here, 300 to 500, more than 500, things moved to the left, which means that the anti-IL-5 antibodies started to work. But somehow I don't think this is going to be the treatment for reduction of exacerbations in COPD. Important question, it was answered in the ATS guidelines that I was involved in. In patients with COPD and blood eosinophilia, so should you use an ICS just for the blood eosinophils? And this is an overwhelming no, in fact, that we didn't make a recommendation. You have to have exacerbations, so you do not treat isolated eosinophilia. So what about withdrawing inhaled steroids? My answer is be very careful. Um, I think that, you know, patients are dyspneic if they're mild and they're on a lab or ICS and um, they don't have exacerbations, I think that's fine. I think patients without any exacerbations, less than two, no hospitalization and are pretty fit. I would be very careful, especially over the COVID period. Um, however, if patients have eosinophils more than 300, do not touch them because I think they will exacerbate. Once you're on ICS, it may be quite difficult to judge 
the blood is in a full count, even though in flame, we looked at all of this, we looked at blood is in a full on ICS and did not see a very much effect. What about mucolytics? I said that bronchitis is important. This studies were mainly in China and showed that if you were not on ICS, you got a benefit from mucolytics. This is a dosti more recently. Really, the effect was on the mild patients, not the moderate and severe. But um, when we looked, I haven't got the slide here, uh, for lengths of exacerbation, there was quite a marked effect. Who would we use macrolides on? We use them after triple or if you know, the guidelines are low eosinophil counts, particularly if there's concomitant infection, bronchiectasis. This is the macro study. The only issue they used azithromycin daily, I wouldn't do that. I would do azithromycin 250 three times a week because azithromycin is very well concentrated um, in the lung and you don't need to give it. There was deafness noted in the macro study, which has not been seen in any other macrolide study, which we think is due to the higher dose. This was our study. We use azithromycin 500 BD as, um, and patients were fine on it for a year. And we also showed a reduction in exacerbations. This is a study where azithromycin we used at hospital admission. Again, patients hospitalized, what else do you do? They're on triple, adding a macrolide. These are high-risk patients. These investigators from Belgium used it for 90 days. And, and you could see the lines separated. They then stopped, the lines came together. They missed significance because they used a composite measure. But if they'd used single measures, they would have uh, had a positive effect. I think there's no doubt macrolides work in COPD, and I think this just shows it's an option with hospital admission. What about reflumolas? Well, this is the problem. If all the studies were without ICS, and I think there was a clear cut benefit on top of ICS, the effects has been more difficult to show. And it was only in these very frequent exacerbators, which I call super exacerbators, more than three exacerbations per year, that a benefit was seen. And interestingly, and this is where the problem comes with this, with low eosinophils, the benefit of reflumolast was mainly in patients with high eosinophils above 150, above 300. Again, this has to be confirmed. And this is why I said, we really, this less than 100 eosinophil group needs to be very carefully um, looked at, because if you believe this, you would not give reflumolast to them. So, but reflumolast affects neutrophilic inflammation, it reduces mucus production. So you do expect it to work. So this was a very quick run through. What exacerbations are, what the phenotypes are, the different types of it. It is complicated, but I think COPD management will become um, simpler in the future. We know that exacerbations have enormous impact more airway infection, faster lung function decline, poor morbidity, worse quality of life, it's all on this. Um, psychological effects, increased cardiovascular risk, I spoke about that, increased hospitalization and increased mortality. And everything we can do to prevent exacerbations is very important indeed. So thank you very much for listening. It's such a great shame we can't meet in person, but hopefully next time. Thank you very much indeed for listening.